ah, this Christianity is so hard and I fail like every day and I don't know how I can do this. Why does the church have to ask so much of me? Yeah, I just want to give up. How will I ever grow? How will I ever do that? That's impossible, right? Okay, last time we looked at how sacrifice can help you perfect any virtue, especially the virtue of chastity. Now today I want to look at what happens to that great gift of sexuality that God has given you when sacrifice is absent. Well, we call that lust. And the Catechism teaches us that lust is when you use your sexuality in an inordinate way, in a way that God did not intend for you to use it, in a way that's missing the mark. That's the definition of sin from the New Testament. It's not just breaking a rule, it's something that's missing the mark. It's not hitting the bullseye that God desires for you. It's not giving you that end goal that you're meant to achieve by your dignity, by your very creation in the image and likeness of God. Now, lust is against true love. Why? Because it turns you inwards and it focuses you on your own desires, your own emotions, your own selfishness, as opposed to being turned outwards in selflessness, in giving of yourself totally and completely towards another person, especially your spouses and by extension, your friends and, and our Lord. So the church gives us a list of sins that break these two commandments. And as I list them, I want you to do two things. Firstly, I want you to think of everything you've learned so far about the gift of chastity, about the great creation that you are in God's eyes and the gifts that God has given you and the great call and the dignity that He has given to you. And then I want you to think about how these various actions and activities break that, how they miss the mark, how they use your gifts in an inordinate way. And secondly, if one of them strikes at your heart, and many of you might, struggle with one or more of these, I invite you to think, how can I imitate that holy monk on Mount Athos? How can I begin to turn my life around day by day, learning how to sacrifice myself to achieve that great call that God has given to me, that great design that is mine in the image and likeness of God? So let's go back to matrimony. Holy matrimony in the eyes of God is about bringing a man and a woman together fully and without reserve. And matrimony has two goods. It has a unitive good. It's supposed to bring the couple together at all times. And it has a procreative good. It's supposed to be open to life at every stage. And both of those two goods have to be kept together and have to be there present at each time. So a sin like adultery was considered a grave offense against the unity of marriage. A sin like divorce for um, trivial reasons as opposed to reasons of safety or things of that nature also breaks the union that God desires for a man and a woman to experience on this earth. A sin like masturbation, masturbation which takes the sexual gift and isolates it so that you focus on your own pleasure as opposed to giving it fully to another to whom you are committed for life. A sin like fornication, sexual union outside of the commitment of marriage is a gift that's never going to be totally unitive because there's always a chance that the other person will not reciprocate eventually. A sin like cohabitation, and free unions or trial marriages breaks the, the ideal of marriage that God has given to you as men and as women. A sin like pornography and prostitution where you take sexual pleasure belonging to another person and take it for yourself and for your own pleasure and for your own immediate gratification and fulfillment, reducing other people 
to objects and instruments for your own immediate gratification. A sin like artificial contraception, techniques that disrupt the unitive and the procreative good that keeps you from giving yourself completely to your spouse and keeps you from having that procreative gift open at all times where you deliberately say, I reject the procreation of children at this moment in time or as can be for a longer period of time or forever. There are sexual sins that involve violence and that would be repulsive to practically anybody nowadays. A sin like rape where someone is abused for my own gratification, where I enslave someone for myself. A sin like sexual abuse of minors um, to which um, we ourselves as, as the Church of Christ um, are not immune and have not been immune in recent times. A sin like um, homosexual actions, an action that acts upon an inclination which the Catechism teaches is intrinsically disordered because it takes away from the perfect complementarity between masculine and female. And I want to underline with the teaching of the Church that it is not the people themselves who are sinful. They must be treated with respect, with compassion and with sensitivity. But that does not mean that everything we do at every moment is reflective of who we are and who God has called us to be. Now I've given you a long list of sins and in one way or another they oppose not only the teachings of the church, they oppose natural law. They oppose what all of humanity, whether Christian or not, is subject to. It closes us to those two great gifts of union of male and female for life and the gift of procreation, the gift of children, one of the most beautiful gifts that God has ever given us. Now to conclude, I want to give you some great hope and some great practical steps that you can apply to your lives. Maybe not all of these will apply to you, but maybe you can use even one or two to change your lives, just like that holy monk on Mount Athos. Firstly, I want to recall who you are. Those of you who are baptized Christians, you are baptized into the death of Christ as St. Paul teaches, and that means you have also risen with Him. You are risen. You are now living a portion of heaven on earth. You have your feet in the ground and your head in the clouds. You're living the glories of heaven, the beginnings thereof, even now on earth. That's your dignity. That's who you are. That's what you're made of. And all you have to do is think back to that. Think back to where you came from. Remember your story. And if you ever fall away from that, if you ever fall short of that, remember your origin. Go back to the beginnings. Breathe so that you may walk and then you might run towards your goal. You have to know yourself. Someone once said, Knowing yourself is a miracle greater than performing miracles. And knowing yourself can mean knowing your strengths, knowing your joys, knowing your loves. But it can also mean, and in fact it must also mean, knowing your weaknesses, knowing what pushes your buttons, knowing your limits. In the old days we used to say, to know the occasions of sin, to know what gets you into trouble. And if you can do that, then you can avoid so much so focus on your greatest sin. And those of you who struggle with the virtue of chastity today, I want you to focus on that. Focus on what gets you into trouble. Are there situations that you get yourselves into where you keep falling? Are there people that are hindering you from achieving the greatness to which you are called? Are there tendencies of thinking even or anything else in your life right now that's holding you back? Know yourself, know your limits, and be willing to get rid of what keeps you from greatness. Now, you've got to be active in your fight. You've got to be ascetics. You've got to be spiritual warriors. You've got to enter that spiritual gymnasium. And the church gives you great gifts to do that. Number one, above all things, prayer. A saint once said, you will either give up sin or you'll give up prayer, one or the other. So pray constantly. St. Paul teaches us in one of his epistles to the Thessalonians, pray without ceasing. 
That means live your whole life as an expression of prayer and fast. Yes, don't be content with fasting from meat only on Fridays of Lent. Do more. Go the extra mile. Even the smallest effort will work wonders in your life. I can tell you that from my own witness. Just a little bit extra will help you to train yourself in self-mastery, which is what we saw chastity was all about. I would also advise you, find yourselves a good spiritual father, a good spiritual director, someone that you trust, someone that you trust in holiness to lead you on this path. You never enter a forest that you don't know without a map. It's the same with the spiritual life. It's a great forest. It's unexplored and it's vast and there's no way you can exhaust it. It's true with that other person too, but that person knows more of the terrain than you. So trust yourself to someone else. Practice virtue every day. In the smallest ways, you'll be amazed how making the smallest effort over here or over there, it might not be linked to this virtue, but the more that you exercise that with bravery and courage, and above all, love of God and love of your neighbor, you'll be amazed how it will begin to transform your life around you. And it will also help you to start looking at other people with a purer vision. If I look at someone, for example, I'm attracted to on the street, I love this person. I'm learning to look at so much more, so much deeper in that person. I don't have time to abuse that person with my thoughts or my words or my actions or my desires but I want what's best for that person. And because I'm used to treating everybody else in my life with that kind of respect, I transfer it to that other person. Keep praying at all times while you do this. Live the presence of God and you'll begin to see God in the faces of other people around you. Now go to confession. So many people think, well, maybe I'll go to confession once a year because that's what the church asks of me. Yes, fine, as a bare minimum. But that doesn't mean that that's all you have to do. I always recommend to people, go to confession often. I even say, go once a month. Go as often as you have to, but go as, as often as you can. Because confession isn't just about speaking your sins. It's about encountering the mercy of God. It's about being filled with the grace of God. The more you come to Him, the more He will bless you. The more you go to someone you love, the more love you will receive in return. That's what the church offers to you in the great mystery of penance. And the more you go, the more you will be blessed and the stronger you will be to be virtuous and to conquer your sins and weaknesses. I encourage everyone to dress as beautifully and as modestly as you can. You don't have to be Victorian, but you can be beautiful, respectful, dignified and modest everywhere you go. Men and women alike, this is something that applies to all of us. And if you do that, you train everybody around you to look into your eyes, to look into your soul. Focus on me, focus on my heart, focus on who I am. And then you will learn to love me more completely than you ever thought you could. And finally, I encourage you from the bottom of my heart. Be like that monk. Never lose faith. Never give up. Persevere until the very end. Because the only one who can give up that war is you, if you choose. Never choose to give up. Because there is always hope. Because there is always the resurrection. Because you are worth it. Because that is your dignity. That is your great call. That is how God sees you. And that is how I see you. And finally, like that monk was advised to turn to the mother of God to help him reduce his cravings. So I want to commend one special devotion to you, a devotion that's becoming really popular around the world. And that's a devotion to the Theotokos of the inexhaustible cup a beautiful devotion that comes out of a, a miraculous healing of a man struggling with alcoholism, with addiction to alcohol. Well, the mother of God, the inexhaustible cup who gave birth to the life of the world can be that inexhaustible cup for you. 
can give birth to her divine son in your hearts and can help to heal you of anything and everything that will keep you from full communion with him. May our most holy lady pray for you and may she through her divine son bless you in abundance with true freedom and true dignity of the children of God. Christ is risen. Indeed, he is risen.